provide you with the lowest per GB rates, night or day. SLT 4G, driving you ever forward. Making headlines on first at nine. The ultimatum. Northern Chief Minister warns TNA to vote against the budget proposal if political prisoners are not released. Controversy of civilian deaths. Professor Chandra Jayasumana reveals how the much debated civilian casualty figure in this conflict came about. Opposition leader provides gloomy assessment to co -chairs. He estimated that fight input costs as many as 40,000 additional deaths and large number of new internally displaced persons. No one left behind. What the UN expects from the national budget. This will hopefully lead to the formulation of an outcome-based budget that prioritizes the needs of the most vulnerable. UNHRC in a pickle. Criticism leveled at the global body for including countries with human rights abuse allegations. A very good evening and welcome to First at Nine on other than a 24-7 Sri Lanka's news channel. I'm Katrina Chang. Now moving on to your top story tonight. Chief Minister of the Northern Province C.V. Vigneshwaran believes that the TNA should give an ultimatum to the government over alleged political prisoners. The Chief Minister said yesterday that members of civil organizations and political representatives asked him to inform the TNA that it should vote against the budget proposal if the government fails to free alleged political prisoners. Chief Minister of the Northern Province C.V. Vigneswaran held a discussion with politicians and representatives of the civil organizations in Jaffna yesterday. The youth who executed orders given by Karunamman are jailed for 18, 19 years. Ones who gave these orders are living a life of luxury and they're not behind bars. The debate regarding the budget proposal will be held in the near future. A particular civil organization proposed that if political prisoners aren't released immediately when decisions regarding the budget proposal are made, the TNA should vote against the budget irrespective of their individual parties. They requested that I convey this message to the government as well as to other relevant parties. If they decide to vote against the budget, in case their demand of the release of political prisoners isn't met, I believe it would be a good move. The public campaign for a new constitution is of the view that the two major parties of the country should arrive at a clear decision over the abolishment of the executive presidency as well as the devolution of power. They expressed their stance on the matter at a seminar held in Nugegoda today. If we defeated the LTT owing to the powers of the executive presidency, then many who governed before Mahinda should have been able to do so. So it is evident that the war was not won due to executive powers but due to other reasons. The Sinhala extremists who are against the abolishment of the executive presidency say that this country will only be governed by a Sinhala leader if the executive presidency remains to be. During a steering committee meeting, members of the SLFP said that they are in favor of the abolishment of the executive presidency, but later they changed their minds. More practical proposals on the devolution of power were suggested by the seven chief ministers representing the SLFP. Those proposals were backed by the opposition leaders of those provinces who are representatives of the UNP. Unfortunately, the official stance of the SLFP turned out to be different to that of the seven chief ministers. The two main parties should arrive at a clear decision on the abolishment of the executive presidency and devolution of power. Uh, former Defence Secretary Gota Abiraja Paksha once more insists that former President Mahindra Rajapaksha will nominate a suitable presidential candidate in due course. He made insistence while addressing the latest in the conference series earlier this afternoon in Godagama. The latest installment of the conference series Elia was worked off under the patronage of former Defence Secretary Gotabe Rajapaksa in Godagama this afternoon. A reparation bill passed with a majority in Parliament recently. It is geared to compensate those who went missing in the North during the war. I asked Ministers Navin Disanayake and Sajid Premadasa why they gave their consent to pay compensation for those who killed their fathers. I also want to ask Minister Sarat Fonseca why he put his hand up to pay compensation from taxpayers' money to those who attempted to kill him. Isn't this a betrayal of the soul to remain in power? 
පාවා දීමක් දෙකින් එක මම ඇත්ත වශයෙන්ම මොහුගේ ගානවා පසුගියද ජිනීව වල මමත් වීරසේකරම ඇතුළුමත් අප පිරිසක් ගිහිල්ලා When Sarath Virasekar and I were in Geneva recently we asked a representative of the Tamil diaspora as to how they came up with the civilian casualty figure of 40000 and where the evidence is He said it was someone from our own country who highlighted that figure Upon my return I set about trying to ascertain the identity of this person. It's none other than current Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe. He cited the figure in January of 2008 when we launched the humanitarian mission in the north after liberating the eastern province. Ranil Wickremesinghe had quoted the civilian casualty figure during a meeting with co-chairman of organizations which provided aid to Sri Lanka and WikiLeaks reveals that the embassy of Japan in Colombo sent a communique to the mainland quoting the figure mentioned by Wickremesinghe. Make a thing of WikiLeaks okay. Opposition leader provides gloomy assessment to coaches. Wickremesinghe predicted that the government would pursue a military solution in the north he estimated that fight in could cause as many as 40000 additional deaths and large number of new internally displaced displaced person e hatalis da hasa aragena thamai darshman prepared his report based on this information the country awaits a leader who can protect the innocent people who lacks comprehension of these documents and agreements everyone asks who the next presidential candidate of the joint opposition is I think that Mahinda Rajpaksha the leader of the people will make that decision at the right moment but it's the United National Party which failed to put forward a leader of their own during the last two elections which has this issue if preparations are made when necessary we can win irrespective of who the candidate is apita jaya grahane karanata puluwan Representatives of High Speed Railway Corporation alleges that State Minister of International Trade Sujeev Singh requested the commission to authorize a high speed train manufacturing plant project however the state minister denies the allegations leveled against him and criticizes the company's activities Sujeev Singh Amatuma State Minister Sujeev Singh met our investors at the Chamber of Commerce in Milan Italy through Director General Arya Singh where a diplomatic meeting unfolded following a meeting with the Sri Lankan ambassador in Italy the minister ushered the group of investors into a separate room and exchanged visiting cards he then went on to introduce them to a personal agent me ava amatanne The minister directed two of our colleagues named Indika Anuruddha and Anton Deshapriya to give him a 10% commission. President Maithripala Sirisena highlights Kampa as a district which faces a tougher time than the rest in facing challenging weather conditions. Addressing the centenary celebrations of the Bandaranaayaka Vidyalaya in Gampaha today, the head of state called on all, including children, to take measures towards mitigating weather-related challenges in the district. President Maithripala Sirisena declared open the X-Ban exhibition, organized in line with the centenary of the Bandaranaayaka Vidyalaya in Gampaha. The head of state paid special attention to the rocket made by student Gihan Hetiarachi which the student claimed can fly 20 kilometers. During an exchange with the student the president pledged full financial banking to the project. During the event president Sirisena also launched the digital school with us. Parisare Pilibandava kathakrama vita Weather conditions in the Gampaha district are most challenging when compared to other districts. The northern province has the thickest forest density which is protected owing to the 30 year long conflict and nothing to do with our influence. Prabhakar needed forests in order to conceal his operations and for military training. Therefore he saved forests. Gampaha district has the least forest density which is 2%. It's 3% in the Colombo district. What I request from all parents as well as children is to plant a tree on your birthday instead of spending money on cakes. Prime Minister Rani Wickremesinghe backs Norway's strategy to generate income utilizing the ocean and says that the government is looking at working with the Nordic nation to conduct oil exploration in the Indian Ocean. He expressed these views at an event held in Galkiriagama today. Prime Minister Ranil Wickremesinghe engaged in an observation tour and declared open the office complex of National Namal Uyana in Ulpadgama in Galkiriagama today. 
other Norway rate. Norway is one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Norway earns their income by crude oil and they are aware that this natural resource will not last forever. Instead of distributing profits earned from crude like other countries, they deposit the income in a separate fund which is to be used when the natural resource runs out. What are they looking as the next alternative? They are looking at how they can generate income by oceans. We are looking to join hands with Norway to help us conduct oil exploration in the Indian Ocean. Former President Mahindra Rajapaksha asserts that a new government should be established to change the anarchic situation that prevails in the country. He said this addressing a function in Ratnapura today. Namal Kumar has very clearly stated that this attempt had government and police involvement. When the case relating to Johnston Fernando was taken up, a lady provided evidence that officials of the FCID had directed her to alter information. The FCID official later admitted that he did so. The discussion between two policemen were also proven true. The case that was filed against the FCID has not been considered to date. It is only the Prime Minister who could file cases with the FCID. He appointed a committee with JVP's Anura Kumara Disanayaka or a representative and it is them, including Rajita and Champika, who issue decisions. How is the law implemented today? There is clear instability within the government and the joint opposition is getting ready to defeat this government. Each year the budget proposal is debated in parliament before ultimately being passed with the focus almost always falling on mega development and other headline sectors. Given the fact this practice leaves some uh, sections of the society behind, UN resident coordinator and UNDP representative Hannah Singer highlights that the national budget of the country should ensure the needs of the most vulnerable segments of society are met. Singh added that this could be achieved by aligning the national budget with the country's sustainable development goal priorities. She also expressed these views at an event last evening. The inauguration ceremony of the workshop on the critical role of parliament and parliamentarians in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals kicked off in Colombo yesterday. The two-day event is organized by the Parliamentary Select Committee on the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development in collaboration with UNDP and the Inter-Parliamentary Union. Parliament and parliamentarians have the potential to be powerful agents of change. I am also very impressed and very pleased to note the progress made so far by the Parliament Select Committee, particularly in uh, advocating for the alignment of the 2018 and 2019 national budget with the country's SDG priorities. This will hopefully lead to the formulation of an outcome-based budget that prioritizes the needs of the most vulnerable and excluded segments of the society. Meanwhile, Speaker of Parliament Karu Jai Surya spoke on the critical role of Parliament and parliamentarians in achieving sustainable development goals. Parliament is, of course, very poorly represented by females, and I wish there are more female representation, giving me a more peaceful and noiseless Parliament. It will be quite obvious that it will be nobody but the Parliament and the parliamentarians that will play the pivotal role in achieving the sustainable development goals in Sri Lanka. Lanka's award-winning news channel, Other Verena 24-7. Welcome back to the news. Convener of the Global Sri Lankan Forum, Dr. Nalika Godeheva, warns that the country's challenging economic situation, if left unarrested, even a future government would struggle to find solutions for it. Speaking to media today, Dr. Godeheva expressed his dismay over the central bank's claim that it no longer believes in intervention to control the exchange rate. He questioned the CBSL's claim, saying that intervention was an accepted practice of the CBSL as recently as two weeks ago. This week, the rupee hit almost 173 to dollar. The fuel prices went up for the fourth consecutive time since the price formula was introduced. Moody's has now rated Sri Lanka lowest amongst Asian countries in its ability to repay debts. Bloomberg 
has identified Sri Lanka as one of the most dangerous countries to invest. Nomura Bank recently came up with a report which identified seven countries which has the highest exchange rate risk and Sri Lanka is amongst that. So bad news is all over. The question is, has the government got any solution to that? Now, a couple of days ago, Central Bank made a very interesting remark where they said that they are no longer believing intervention to control exchange rate. It is interesting because for the last 22 years, Central Bank has been doing that and the current government also believed in that until two weeks ago. So these all show that the current government is in a completely confused state of affairs and they have no solution to come out of this economic crisis. Now, when this continues, the only thing the government seems to be doing, one, increasing its borrowings, two, taxing people more and more, and three, selling national assets. Other than that, they don't seem to be having any solution. If this trend continues, it is going to be a very, very serious problem for the country that even a future government will struggle to find solutions. Now, during a recent interview with Reuters, Minister of Finance Mangla Samravira said that Sri Lanka plans to put two state-owned hotel companies up for sale within the next six months, intending to raise $500 million for the island nation as it seeks to bolster its finances. This move comes at a time where Sri Lanka faces repayments on expensive infrastructure foreign loans and already has a hefty debt burden with the rupee also plumbing record lows. State Minister of Finance Aran Vikramaratna backed the statement made by Finance Minister Mangda Samravira on the plans to sell two state-owned hotel companies within the next six months, which intends to raise $500 million. During an interview held recently, the state minister said, we are going through the legal hoops of preparing the sales. It will maybe take six months to get over that. The state minister had also said that Sri Lanka would reopen bidding for national carriers Sri Lankan Airlines in a few months' time. A Reuters report says four members on, of an election panel in the Maldives fled to Sri Lanka, citing intimidation and threats a day before its top courtiers defeated President Abdullah Yamin's challenge to his election loss last month. The tourist paradise has been in political upheaval since February, when a state of emergency was imposed by Yamin, who ran the Indian Ocean Island with an iron hand. Critics say jailing political opponents and Supreme Court justices. Since Yamin lost his bid for re-election, the opposition has been trying to secure smooth transition of power due on November 17th. Four members of the Maldives Elections Commission have fled and three are in the Sri Lankan capital of Colombo. Leaving behind just one panel member, two of the Maldivian officials told Reuters on condition of autonomy. Yamin's party dismissed the threat accusations, saying the election officials left because of public outrage sparked by the leak of an audio recording about poll rigging. Speaking to Reuters, Secretary General of the Progressive Party of Maldives, Mohammad Hussein Sharif said that the said officials fled because of public outrage following a leaked audio about rigging which they are refusing to clarify. The officials' accusations follow domestic media reports of a complaint to police by the company that printed the ballots, saying that PPM sought to bribe its employees to provide false statements that backed Yamin's challenge. Yamin's party called the complaint ludicrous saying it was a tactic to divert attention from the court case. Meanwhile, the United States has reiterated the threat of sanctions with the Supreme Court due to rule on President Abdullah Yamin's petition to annul the September 23rd election. Deputy spokesman at the State Department Roberto Palladino announced on its Twitter account today that the US was concerned by troubling events in the Maldives that threatened to undermine the will of the Maldivian people, including the Supreme Court case and threats against members of the Election Commission. The United Nations is drawing criticism for including countries that have been widely criticized for severe human rights abuses among the 18 newly elected members of its Human Rights Council. Campaigners had urged UN member states to oppose the candidacy of the Philippines and Eritrea, saying the choice of Bahrain and Cameroon raised significant concerns. 
Bahrain, Cameroon and the Philippines were among a number of nations controversially elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council yesterday, sparking sharp criticism from rights groups and the United States. Around a third of the seats on the 47-member council based in Geneva were open for slots lasting from 2019 to 2022. A 97-vote majority from the 193 nations that make up the UN's General Assembly is needed for approval. For the first time since the council was created in 2006, each voting region agreed in advance on 18 candidates to run for 18 seats, removing any competition. New members Bahrain, Cameroon, the Philippines, Somalia, Bangladesh and Eritrea were elected with between 160 and 178 votes. It immediately drew criticism from activists in Europe and North America, dismissing them as unqualified due to their human rights records. New York-based Human Rights Watch says, by putting forward serious rights violators and presenting only as many candidates as seats available, the regional groups risk undermining the council's credibility and effectiveness. Louis Charbonneau, the group's UN director, called the vote ridiculous and said on Twitter, it makes mockery of the word election. Let's take a look at other emerging stories from across the globe. A landslide following heavy rains in eastern Uganda has killed more than 40 people. It is feared that the death toll could rise as a government rescue team reaches the area of Mount Elgin. A river burst, its banks and a torrent of mud and water swept villages away. A landslide in the same region, Bududa, killed more than 300 people in 2010. Rescuers are picking their way through devastated areas of northwest Florida amid fears the death toll from Hurricane Michael will rise. At least 17 deaths have been confirmed so far in a swathe of destruction stretching up to Virginia. Rescuers have still to reach the worst affected areas of Florida's flattened Mexico beach. Auction House Sadabi says the woman who bid more than $1 million for a painting by the mysterious British artist Banksy, which shred itself into pieces at the moment of the sale, has gone ahead with the purchase. Onlookers gasped and laughed after the bottom half of Girl with Balloon, one of Banksy's best-known works, was sucked into a shredder hidden in its frame as the hammer fell after a bid of $1.38 million. Banksy himself posted an Instagram picture of shocked attendees watching the painting disintegrate last week with the caption, Going, going, gone. You are watching Sri Lanka's premier news channel, Other Dharana 24-7. Second seed Novak Djokovic eased into the final of the Shanghai Masters today while inflicting a 6-2-6-1 defeat on German Alexander Zverev in the first semi-final. In the days of the semi, top seed uh, Roger Federer lost to Borna Koric 6-4-6-4. South Africa's Kevin Anderson, meanwhile, had his hopes of a payback over his Wimbledon final defeat dashed yesterday. There was no revenge for Kevin Anderson for his Wimbledon final defeat at the Shanghai Masters yesterday when he lost to Novak Djokovic in the quarter final. The Serbian world number three was forced into a tie break by the big hitting South African in the first set but eased to a 7 1 score. Djokovic followed up with a dominant display in the second set to win the match 7 6 6 3, repeating the victory he gained over Anderson at the year's Wimbledon. Roger Federer, meanwhile, battled past world number 12 Kei Nishikori in the quarter final. The world number two oozed class throughout a high quality quarter final matchup against the Japanese, who threatened a second set comeback in China before succumbing in a tiebreaker. 37 year old Federer, who last won a Masters title in this event last year, came through 6 4 7 6 after coming from 4 1 down in the deciding tiebreak. Time for you to get the latest in showbiz with our segment 70 Seconds of Entertainment. Johnny Depp has said he felt bad for author J.K. Rowling after the backlash she received for supporting his casting in the Fantastic Beasts film series. In December, Rowling said she was genuinely happy about Depp's casting despite accusations of domestic violence by his ex-wife Amber Heard. 
Yet another fairy tale wedding, Princess Eugenie, the ninth in line to the throne, married her long term partner Jack Brooksbank at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle yesterday. The royal wedding saw many celebrities in their guest list, including Kate Moss, Robbie Williams, Naomi Campbell, Ellie Goulding, and Demi Moore. Supermodel and dear friend of the princess, Cara Delevingne, was among the much talked about for her Emporia Armani tuxedo with tails and a cropped cigarette pant with a Chanel top hat. We'll see how the weekend goes, but for now, Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper's A Star Is Born is the top movie in North America, passing the movie Venom, known as one of Marvel's most enigmatic, complex characters. Warner Brothers' $36 million budget romantic drama earned $4.5 million on Thursday, and that gives the Oscar frontrunner a solid $66.16 million US dollars seven-day total, including previews. Sri Lanka's number one news channel, other than 24-7. Sheila Fernando is at the other than weather center with your forecast first evening edition. A very good evening to our viewers and welcome to Forecast First. Starting off with your temperatures for tomorrow that vary between 20 and 30 degrees Celsius with the highest of 30 expected in Ampara. Well, when looking at the map, a low pressure zone will develop in the central hills and will gradually spread to the other parts of the island. Well, according to the Department of Meteorology, rainy conditions prevailing in the country are likely to continue with fairly heavy falls of about 100 millimeters expected at some places in the central Uwa and Sabraga more provinces and in Batiklo and Polonarwa districts. That's all from the Weather Centre tonight. Up next is your City by City forecast. And that is it for Mother Derna first at 9 for tonight. But before we go, we are taking you to the royal wedding of Princess Eugenie and her partner Jack Brooksbank, where the couple tied the knot at St. George's Chapel in Windsor Castle yesterday. About 850 guests witnessed the wedding ceremony of Princess Eugenie, the 19th line to the throne. We hope you enjoy these visuals and have a pleasant evening. Bringing you the news and information 24 hours a day. This is Sri Lanka's premier news channel. Other Varana, 24-7.